Hello, this is Kenneth Train. This is part of an ongoing series of interviews with Berkeley economists. Today, I am honored to have as our guest uh, George Akerlof. George won the Nobel Prize in Economics this year. Um, and as I understand, you just got back from Stockholm. The uh, award ceremony uh, is a magnificent affair, but they also have a whole week of activities yeah. for you. Yeah. What were some of these festivities that they had planned? Oh, there were, there were a great number. Um, it began with a symposium. There was a symposium on behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. And then there were just a very large number of activities. Um, I gave a, lec a big lecture on my research. And I gave that in three, three different uh, universities. And uh, there was a, a lunch at the ambassadors. There were concerts. There was the award ceremony. There was a banquet after that. And there, I, gave a, I gave a seminar. There were lots and lots of other things. So well, it was now, a very crowded week. It is a crowded week. Now, yeah. you also met the king and queen, didn't you? Oh, yeah, we met the king and queen. But, uh, and, did you talk uh, also, about economics? Um, I, yes, we talked about economics so just a little bit. And we also met the crown uh, princess. And, and her brother, the prince. Yes. So. And there was a uh, banquet at Uppsala Castle? Uh, there was a ba banquet at Uppsala Castle, too. And now it's also traditional, isn't it, for the laureates to um, meet with the president before going to Stockholm. Did that happen? Oh, there? yes. Yeah, yeah. We met, we met with Bush. So with you president met with Bush. President Bush. And yes. Did uh, he have anything to say about your economics? Uh, no. Luckily, he didn't. <laughs> what did you all talk about? Um, well, actually, uh, we talked about the fact that he had a daughter at Yale and I have a son at Yale. <laughs> so um, I thought that was a polite conversation. I didn't want to talk about his economics. Yes, <laughs> that's a good conversation. Um, now, about your work that led to the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Uh, this all started back with an article that you did on uh, used cars called yes. The Market for Lemons. That's right. So can you just briefly explain what that was and how it was so revolutionary? Yes. Yeah. Well. Uh, the market for lemons is about asymmetric information. And the idea of asymmetric information is uh, that buyers and sellers often have very different information. That's, it's just part of the natural process. So if you're the owner of a car, you know about it. You know right. about, what, what, right. about the number of whether it's a good car or a bad car. If it's a bad car, what you'd like to do is you'd like to get rid of it. If it's a good car, what you want to do is you want to keep it. But then that poses a problem. It poses a problem because the sellers, if you're trying to sell this car, they have to worry about why you're selling it. And so that is, in fact, uh, a problem which we all know about in the market for used cars, but it's a problem that, in fact, is true in every single market. Whenever you're a buyer, you have to worry about why the, why the person's selling something. And whenever you're a seller of a product, or sometimes when you're a seller of a product, you have to worry about why the buyer wants to buy it, particularly you're selling something with, with variable terms like insurance. And this leads so, to some kind of market failure? So there can be all kinds of market failure in this. So if you're the potential uh, buyer of a used car, you worry why the person is selling it. If you're the worry, if you're selling it, you know that the buyers are going to be avoiding you, and therefore you're not going to get a very good price for it. So, in the extreme, what can happen is that markets can totally collapse. And I'll give you an example of that. So, leading example of that is health insurance. Right. If you, as an individual, decide you want to buy health insurance, you'll just find it very difficult. Why? Because who are the people who most want health insurance? They're the people who are sick. And so the insurance companies find that they don't that they don't they don't want to sell to people who are just sick. In fact, they can't really afford to do so. And so, you can't buy health insurance as an individual. What in fact you do is there are all kinds of ways in which people do buy health insurance, but it's very imperfect. Typically, the way people buy health insurance is they they are grouped with other people, 
and you buy it through your employer. Right. So now with these um, market failures, usually the response in the standard economics class mm -hmm. is when there's market failures, you need government intervention yeah. to solve the problem. Yeah. So in this case, say with used cars, is there a yeah. need for government intervention or is there some type of market well, actually, solution there, to the market failure? There has been some government intervention. There have been lemon laws mm -hmm. which require disclosure. It's probably a good law. I think it makes the market, makes the market better. Uh, in health insurance, of course, for older people, the government's taken over and supplies Medicare for older people because older people wouldn't have been able to buy uh, medical insurance. Um, so there is, the other thing is that, this, as I said, this is a problem in almost every market you think of. So it's very important in, uh, in credit markets. And there's regulation of credit markets. There's very close regulation of credit markets. And the way that a very large amount of the regulation of credit markets is, is written, like the Securities and Exchange Commission, which determines the information that people have to disclose regarding stocks, a very large amount of that is to take care of these problems of the buyer, of the seller of the stock potentially knowing more about it than the buyer. Right. Now, as I recall, you had um, difficulties publishing this article that has yeah, now yeah, led to a right. Nobel Prize. Yeah, right. What what happened? Well, I th it, it was t rejected three times before it was accepted. <laughs> so uh, I sent it to the American Economic Review, and I sent it to the Review of Economic Studies and the Journal of Political Economy. And, um, well, I think that the article was different, actually. That's, I think, one of the reasons that um, uh, one of the reasons that, that this topic was available. It was, it was different. It was different from the way people looked at economics at the time. So the way people looked at economics at the time was there were some very general propositions that people would make that would depend upon a very general model, mm -hmm. which was the model of standard model of perfect competition. And then people would talk about, well, maybe these things don't quite fit perfect competition, then we'll talk about it. But here, the idea was instead of having general principles and deriving propositions from general principles, here what we did was I took a specific example. The specific example was the market for used cars. It seems too prosaic to write an article about right. just the market for used cars. Everybody knows about it. But of course, that was my exact point. Everybody knew about it. And therefore, you could think about the market for used cars and then, then think about the principles that were involved there. And from that, you could uh, figure out uh, general principles that would apply to many different markets. Right. But that wasn't the way people were... were uh, were reasoning at the time. And so, so it was a change. It was, it was, we were just at the moment when this was written, at the time that there was a change in how people were thinking about how to do economics. And I was just lucky to be there, right there, at the time that this thing was changing. Right. So the lesson is if your article is rejected three times, it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean you've done bad work. No, you, well, you should try it for could the, lead to a Nobel Prize. You well, never you should know. try for the fourth. <laughs> try for the fourth. Yeah. Now, in your Nobel lecture, you also talked about um, work that you've done on the lingering discrepancy between black Americans and white Americans in yes. income levels, poverty rates, incarceration yes. rates, yes. and what some of the root causes of these yeah. uh, lingering discrepancies are. And how did you get into this work in the first place? Well, I think this is actually the most important social and economic issue in America is especially the, the gap between African Americans and um, and the rest of the population. That, uh, and I feel this is a special uh, problem for which everybody uh, in America has a special responsibility, that this has always been the American dilemma of the gap between white Americans and black Americans. And, and now I think we see we're living in a moment where there are something like two million people uh, currently incarcerated. That's a very large number. Uh, the incarceration rates for African Americans is 
is very high, and I think it's too high. I think this is um, the reasons. I'm sh I know that there are many. There are some people in prison who were there, um, who were there for, for good, for very good reason. But I think most of the people in prison are there for situational reasons. They just happen to get into a situation in which they did something that was bad. And the question is, how did they get into that situation? How do we create a better society in which we avoid the situations where so many people get themselves into trouble? And it seems to me that that's, that's a responsibility for everybody. Now, what would economics have to say about this in addition to the insights that have already been provided in, say, sociology and yeah. psychology? How does economics contribute to this issue? Well, I feel this is an economic issue. And it's not what economics per se has to say. It's the fact that um, this is a uh, this is a leading economic issue, and therefore, insofar as the economics doesn't agree with the sociology, then it has to be up to the eco to economists to figure out what the sociology is and to adapt our economics so that we do have something to say about that. Great. Well, I also want to turn yeah. to your wife. You were yeah. married to yeah. a very famous economist, yeah. Janet Yellen. Um, I have always admired you, too, for being able to keep up with your careers and support yeah. each other yeah. in uh, your yeah. respective paths. Um, I've always wanted to know, how did you, how did you two meet? Um, well, I was on leave from Berkeley at the Federal Reserve, and there was a party for somebody who was leaving the Federal Reserve, and we met there. So I think it was probably, we worked in pretty similar fields. It's probably inevitable that we'd, we, we'd meet at some time. But where we happened to meet was she, Janet was working at the Federal Reserve, and I was there uh, on. And you the, were both economists at we're that time. We were both economists, yeah. So you had the mutual interest <laughs> That's right, from that yes. endeavor. Um, now, Janet was actually called to Washington, D.C. to be uh, on the Federal Reserve Board and then uh, as an yeah. advisor to the president. Yeah. How did you handle that in your relationship? Did you go to D.C. or did you commute? What? <laughs> yeah. So uh, Janet moved. We, we moved to Washington. We moved the house. And uh, Berkeley gave me leave in the fall terms for the first three years. Mm -hmm. And I commuted back to teach uh, from Washington. And, uh, you know, it, it was great to, for Janet. Uh, to have these jobs, I thought they, 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 it was it was wonderful to be there, and you know we would discuss. She would come home, and we would discuss the issues of the day. And well, it was great to be able to participate in that. Right, you've actually done a lot of joint work together. Yes, as a husband wife team. Yes, um, one of these was on uh, unwed mothers and the yes. growth in um, yeah. out of wedlock um, births. Yes, uh, yeah. as I understand, the the kind of prevailing concept was that uh, the existence of welfare payments yep. makes um, increase the number of out of wedlock births, but that you believe that's not true. Uh, what was the basis for for your your reasoning? Well, there was a there were a very large number of changes in social customs um, just at the time that there was, were the changes in out of wedlock births. And um, there was also um, there was a very large change in the stigma that was associated with having an out of wedlock birth, and so that I think that people may have it the, the whole change in welfare reversed. Um, the conservative notion was that the rise in welfare caused the increase in out-of-wedlock births. Why not look at it in the opposite way? The opposite way was that we were going to have a very large increase in the n number of out-of-wedlock births. There were all kinds of social changes that occurred precisely at the time that this occurred. It was the time of the Vietnam War in which was there a great deal of social pr uh, protest. And there were, uh, there were very large numbers of changes in uh, sexual practice right at this time. Well, Both of these things you would have expected would have increased the number of out-of-wedlock births. And so you ought to look at the change in welfare in the exactly the opposite way. 
there were going to be a very large number of increased in out-of-wedlock births. There was a need for an increase in welfare because what welfare does, it takes care of people who, have, who do have problems. Now, so is there a way to empirically determine which direction the causation goes? Was there a, uh, can you tell whether there's an increase in welfare preceding the increase in the birth? I, th I think, in fact, we've looked at the statistics. I think it's actually very difficult to, 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 look, at the, to look at this. There's a sort of a 10-year period in which this change particularly took place, and both things were taking place at the same time. And so I, I think it actually is, is rather difficult to say whether the welfare caused the out-of-wedlock births or whether it was the increase in, in out-of-wedlock births and also in uh, female-headed households that was associated with the change in welfare. Right. But I think one has to remember something about welfare. Every time you reduce welfare, you have to think about the fact that there are going to be women and there are going to be children who are supported by that welfare. And if you reduce the support payments to people on welfare, you are reducing the, the payments to the poorest people in our society, and that includes especially those poorest children. Yes. Well, we need to wrap up here. Um, I want to say thank you. Oh, like I said before, I'm very honored to oh, have you here. You. Thanks a lot. <laughs> a great member of our faculty. Well,